Okay, welcome uh, everybody. Great to see you this morning. And um, it's really my great honor to introduce the Slatopolsky Lectureship for you today. This is, um, uh, Dr. Slatopolsky is with us, I'm happy to say. Ed, great to see you. He drove in on his blue Ferrari, which is parked right outside. And Dr. Slatopolsky is truly a triple threat, and he's made remarkable contributions in patient care, teaching, and scientific investigation. He has trained generations of academic nephrologists and scientists that carry on his legacy today in their own research laboratories. With his groundbreaking work in the areas of parathyroid hormone and vitamin D biology, chronic kidney disease, and metabolic bone disease, Dr. Slatopolsky's discoveries have improved the lives of our patients who suffer from kidney disease. In this renal division photo from 1981, we can see Dr. Slatopolsky uh, uh, here in the front row next to Salo Klar and Mabel Perkerson and then Mark Hammerman, my, my predecessor, all giants in nephrology. And it's hard to believe, but Dr. Slatopolsky had already been in the renal division for as a faculty member for 15 years when this photo was taken. This is Dr. Slatopolsky's famous rooster named Macho. This particular rooster was a mean one, but it produced the most potent and specific antibody against PTH the world had seen and enabled countless laboratories to measure PTH levels for the first time. In fact, we still have Macho in the renal division today, and I'm not joking. <laughs> he is stuffed and is in pretty good shape, all things considered. Um, it is not an exaggeration to say that we in nephrology do view Eduardo as Superman, but we also appreciate his wonderful sense of humor and panache. We are also humbled and grateful at Ed's remarkable generosity to the division and school as well. He established the Eduardo and Judith Slatopolsky Professor of Medicine and Nephrology Professorship, which is held by Dr. Jeff Miner, who is also here in the audience today. Thank you, Jeff, and um, at, who serves as its inaugural incumbent. Dr. Slatopolsky, it is truly a distinct honor to have you here today, and thank you, thank you for all of your remarkable contributions to the school and division and department over the last 56 years. It is an equal pleasure to introduce our speaker today, this morning, Dr. Kathleen Liu. She received her Bachelor of Arts degree in biochemistry from Harvard University and her medical and graduate degrees from uh, UCSF as part of the medical scientist training program. She completed residency at Brigham and Women's Hospital and both a nephrology and critical care fellowship back at UCSF in days when it was actually quite unusual for nephrologists to seek critical care training unlike today. And she began as faculty and remains as professor of medicine at UCSF to this day. She serves as medical director of the MICU at UCSF and her research program is focused on AKI and ARDS. She has made important contributions to our understanding of the long-term sequelae of AKI and AKI biomarkers. She's received many honors, including election to the ASCI, reception of the Exceptional Physician Award from UCSF Health, and the Distinguished Leader Award from the American Society of Nephrology. The title of her talk is Post-AKI Care. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Liu to Washington University. Great. Thanks so much, Ben, for that really kind introduction. It really is an honor and a privilege to be here to honor Dr. Slatopolsky. Today I'm going to talk to you about post-AKI care, which has been an area of my interest for the last 10 years or so, and it's a little humbling to think about how time flies. Feels like only yesterday I was a young intern. Uh, let's see if I can advance my slides. Great. So you can remember nothing else from my talk today, right? My bottom line is that no matter how you slice it and no matter what part of internal medicine you're in, AKI is truly bad news. And for the outline for today, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we got here, some of the important definitions and conceptual models that underlie sort of our talks about um, uh, AKI. 
I'm going to talk then a little bit about what happens to our patients who have AKI. I'm going to focus first on our dialysis requiring AKI population, but then I'm going to remind you that that's a tiny fraction of the patients who we see who in fact have acute kidney injury across the spectrum of the hospital. And then finally, I'm going to tell you about some exciting work that's ongoing um, uh, to improve outcomes for patients after an episode of moderate to severe AKI. And this is Importantly, I'm going to say a lot of this is really the team science, and you're going to see work that really sort of spans a number of institutions um, sort of over the course of this talk. So um, this is a slide that I think really highlights sort of when Ben and I were young trainees, sort of the state of AKI, right? The field of AKI was really stymied for a number of years because different papers used different definitions of AKI because each clinician sort of felt like they knew AKI sort of when they saw the disease, right? So if you look at the literature from from 20 years ago, each paper in the field really uses a different definition of disease, and that makes it tremendously difficult for us to compare disease at UCSF to disease at WashU because people would use different non-interchangeable definitions. And so this led to sort of a, this led to sort of a, the, this area of increased definition, dif definitional precision in the field. Um, I'll say that nephrologists are a little bit different than ARDS docs, right? The ARDS field came up with a definition, stuck to it for 20 to 25 years. Nephrology saw a series of definitions occur in sort of rapid sequence. I'm not going to belabor these definitions, but I know that most people who aren't nephrologists don't go around thinking about what the definition of KDGO stage 2 AKI is. So just to sort of level set for all of us, what I'll say is that these three definitions have been uh, rapidly evolved. Our most contemporaneous definition is the KDGO definition. Um, these definitions all have serum creatinine criteria as well as urine output criteria. The vast majority of studies in the field use the serum creatinine criteria, not the urine output criteria, because urine output is actually hard to measure from the electronic health record, as you all know, from your clinical work. Um, over the next few years, you will see, I think, a revision of the definitions. KDGO is in the process of revising and reviewing sort of all of the data in the field of AKI, and there will be new AKI guidelines over the next couple of years, so stay tuned. There may be some changes. But the key thing about the sort of staging system as we think about it is that we really have come up with a definition with mild, moderate to severe disease. The mild definition is intended to really be somewhat imprecise, right? It's an increase in serum creatinine by more than 0.3 milligrams per deciliter over 48 hours or a 1.5-fold increase in creatinine, right? So really trying to identify patients, some of whom are pre-renal, some of who have ATN, but casting a wide net for what AKI is. Obviously, the more severe you get, the more specific you get. And if you wonder why we got to these sort of small changes in serum creatinine, this is a really important paper that now is almost 20 years old from Glenn Schertow um, and colleagues, um, uh, really highlighting the fact that even these small changes in serum creatinine, a 0.3 milligram per deciliter rise in creatinine in your patient in the hospital is associated with a 4.1 fold, fold increase in the odds of death in a multivariable adjusted analysis. So these small changes really do matter, right, um, uh, when you're thinking about your patients on the ward. The other important paradigm that I want to highlight is this paradigm of acute and chronic uh, kidney disease, right? For many years, we thought of these as two completely separate entities. Um, and if I had rewritten this slide, I would say that there's now some ground in between, which I'll comment on in the next couple of slides. I want to remind you that this um, uh, view of recovery after AKI is really dated in our view from the 1950s, right? And this was based on studies that were focused on very different patient populations from who we see with AKI now in the hospital, right? These studies were um, typically of much younger patients in their 20s to 30s. The etiologies for AKI were quite different from what we see now. These were relatively small studies. And importantly, when you look at the data in these small classic studies, the, clear, the renal clearance was not normal. The inulin clearance ranged from 35 to 106 mils per minute. So many of these patients, in fact, had chronic kidney disease. They didn't need dialysis, but they did not fully recover their kidney function. And so this led to this new paradigm um, sort of in the field, right, where acute kidney injury and chronic kidney disease are uh, very closely interlinked, and obviously risk factors uh, are shared by these two diseases. And there's been a lot of interest, which we'll talk about over the, uh, the next little bit of the talk, on sort of the common outcomes of these two diseases. And I should have said that, you know, there's now focus in the field that, you know, acute kidney injury is an acute disease. Chronic kidney disease does not start until after 90 days of disease. And now there's been this focus on acute kidney disease as an entity that is hybrid between AKI and chronic kidney disease. 
And that, I will say, is very much an epidemiologic feature, right? It's not necessarily its sort of own entity in and of itself. So I want to turn now to this question of what happens to patients of, after AKID. And I'm going to share with you a case of a, of a, of a real patient. Um, so this is a 41-year-old woman who I saw as a junior faculty member now probably 15 years ago. So she was a 41-year-old woman. Uh, she had undergone a redo uh, aortic valve replacement and a cabbage. She had um, previously required uh, an AVR um, in, at the age of 28, and she underwent this procedure after she represented with syncopal episodes. So she underwent a bental procedure and three-vessel cabbage. This was unfortunately a rather complicated procedure, and I met her on ECMO in the ICU receiving CRT. Her baseline creatinine was 0.7 to 0.8, um, and she ultimately required CRT for two weeks and then transitioned to intermittent dialysis. So show of hands in the room, what is the likelihood she's gonna come off dialysis? How many people think it's less than 25%? Great, okay, one person. How about 25 to 50%? A lot more people. Uh, 50 to 75? Great, it's more than 75%. Great. Oh, we got, did we have one more than one optimist more than 75%? Great. So this patient, Marla, was in fact seen in nephrology clinic at UCSF two to three months after she discharged. She actually referred to um, one of our nephrologists because she remained on intermittent dialysis and she was seen by her transplant surgeons for evaluation for kidney transplant. She in fact came off dialysis. Her creatinine peaked at 4.3. And this slide needs to be edited because this is now 10 years later. Her cramp remains stable at two to, in the two range. She's advanced CKD, but she's been off dialysis now for years. She's one of our important patient advocates for uh, AKID. So this brings me to sort of one of the points that I want to make, that the likelihood of renal recovery is really fundamentally linked to premorbid GFR. And this is data that comes from an observational study from Helmut Schiffel, um, as well as data from Kaiser Permanente of Northern California, generated by Chi Shu, my chief at UCSF. And this is one of my favorite slides, actually, when I attend in the MICU to share with the house staff, right? Because this is the question that we're asked all the time when we start patients on dialysis in the ICU, right? Doctor, what's my chance of coming off dialysis? Or is my loved one going to come off dialysis? And this slide makes the point that your likelihood of renal recovery is fundamentally linked to your premorbid GFR. Now, the estimates that I'm showing you here for our, our patients um, who have normal renal function are probably a little optimistic with renal recovery of 100%. It's not quite 100% for sure, right? Not surprisingly, right, if you have normal kidney function, it takes something pretty severe to get you to dialysis requiring acute kidney injury. So the mortality for those patients is in fact quite high, over 50%, but their likelihood, as I alluded to, of renal recovery uh, is really excellent, right? Not surprisingly, there's a graded relationship between um, pre-admission GFR and likelihood of renal recovery, but if you look at our patients with CKD stage four, these are obviously people who have significant comorbidities, they still are quite sick, so their inpatient mortality is quite high, but their likelihood of renal recovery is about 35%, right? So this is actually much more optimistic than I think we would be typically as nephrologists and highlights the importance of actually looking for renal recovery in our patients who have AKID in the hospital. Similarly, right, nephrologists think not just about GFR as a marker for chronic kidney disease. Um, we also think about, uh, pre we think about proteinuria. And so this is data, again, um, generated by Ben Lee, one of our fellows at UCSF, focused on uh, AKI recovery um, uh, after, uh, in patients who have measurements of proteinuria. So this is, um, again, a study of Kaiser Permanente of Northern California, which we consider highly representative of Northern California. In this analysis, um, uh, but reflecting the fact that many of these patients had CKD, about 70% of patients with AKID identified in this cohort had premorbid measurements of proteinuria. You can see that about half of them had two plus or greater proteinuria, about a quarter had no proteinuria, and a quarter had one plus proteinuria. And you can see that there's a very marked relationship in the, um, in the um, uh, likelihood of non-recovery of renal function uh, based on proteinuria. So again, as you think about risk stratifying your patient, think not just about GFR, but if you happen to have a premorbid measure of proteinuria, that may, they may, that may add additional data, right? So your proteinuric stage four CKD patient, less likely to recover renal function. Your stage two non-proteinuric patient, probably much more likely to recover renal function. And this is just another slide from the same analysis here. Uh, not, Lack of proteinuria is shown in blue, one plus in orange, uh, two plus in gray, and this is um, 
uh, just highlighting that this relationship holds across all strata of GFR and kind of highlighting that relationship that I just indicated, that our advanced CKD patients are the least likely to recover. Nonetheless, I'll say in this analysis, a quarter of patients with stage four CKD with two plus partneria still are recovering. So recovery is an important thing to look for. So this turns me to the concept of dialysis for, di for AKID. When does a good thing become a bad thing, right? We actually have some really striking data from our acute inpatient studies of dialysis. I'm not gonna be talking about the initiation of dialysis for AKID, but suffice to say that we now have three to four large randomized clinical trials in the critical care literature, suggesting that there is no benefit to early dialysis in patients with um, AKI in the ICU, right? These are all robustly done analyses where patients are randomized to either receive dialysis early when they have stage two to three AKI, doubling of creatinine, or when they meet pre-specified um, metabolic criteria for dialysis, or have extended AKI, as I like to think of it. These studies have all shown that there's no benefit to that early strategy. I think the really humbling thing about these studies is that in all of these studies, about 35% of patients in the delayed strategy wind up recovering renal function and never needing renal replacement therapy. So making the point that, in fact, when people have early AKI, we can wait and see a little bit. And this has changed sort of our concept of when to start dialysis. And these studies have further highlighted that there may, in fact, be a downside to this early dialysis. So this is the START AKI a study, a study that I was uh, very fortunate to work on with Ron Wald and Sean Bagshaw. This is an analysis of almost 3,000 patients with um, AKI randomized to either an accelerated dialysis strategy, that standard dialysis strategy, just like a Kiki, no difference in outcomes. Um, and uh, it, again, about a third of the patients never needed dialysis. If you look at renal replacement therapy dependence among survivors at 90 days, you can actually see that 10.4% of patients in that early arm still require dialysis compared to just 6% in the standard strategy where you wait and see. So, sort of making this point that maybe dialysis and starting early is not a good thing for these patients, and in fact, we are, uh, we are not able to see renal recovery. There is some uncertainty in this field. If you look sort of across a number of studies, really start AKI is the study where you see this most striked difference in renal recovery. Um, so really, if you do, do a meta-analysis of all the studies in the field, there's really no difference here. Now, now um, this is data from the ATN trial generated by Anitha Vijayan, who I know many of you know. Um, uh, and this is data that Anitha generated, uh, you know, in part with uh, patients here from WashU. So this is data from the ATN trial. This is a study of dose of dialysis in acute kidney injury, comparing patients receiving an intensive uh, dialysis strategy six times a week, intermittent dialysis, or high-intensity CRRT, depending on hemodynamic stability, compared to a less intensive strategy three times a week dialysis, less intensive dose of CRRT. And in this analysis, Anitha focused on the patients who um, only received intermittent dialysis as their modality of therapy. And what you can see here is very similarly, a very striking difference in the rate of renal recovery amongst patients randomized to the six times per week um, therapy versus the um, three times a week therapy um, and uh, a greater number of renal replacement free days in the same analysis. Why is this the case, right? Um, there's been a lot of interest in this. Um, one of the mechanisms by which this may occur is due to intradilytic hypotension. Um, this is just a slide making the point that if you look at studies looking at intradilytic hypotension, that this is a common phenomenon in critically ill patients, ranging in this slide from 17 to 87%. So many of our patients during renal recovery are experiencing some uh, episodes of hypotension, excuse me, during dialysis and kind of gets to the question um, that I've been very interested in for the last uh, three to five years, which is how do we decide to stop dialysis in patients um, with AKI? This is data um, actually from our pediatric colleagues. They did some very nice surveys thinking about how you stop dialysis in pediatric patients. And so this is um, data where they asked clinicians sort of how they decided to stop dialysis and what factors uh, they used. Unfortunately, this is not a color figure, but I think it makes the important point that they really had sort of multiple different reasons why clinicians could stop dialysis. And if you look at the preferences, they're all over the place. So there's clearly no consensus about how this group of clinicians is deciding to stop dialysis. So we at UCSF um, are very interested in this question of early dialysis, and we uh, have an ongoing clinical trial, which we call Liberated, um, uh, 
Uh, this is um, a trial that Anitha again participated in when she was here at WashU and contributed patients to, and I'm hoping that with some of the new connections we're making here to Gustavo that we'll be able to continue this trial uh, potentially here. So our interest here is in the concept of how we get patients off dialysis and dialysis weaning. Um, our intervention is to hold dialysis until specific metabolic or physiologic criteria are met. And our comparator is to a standard three times a week dialysis strategy for patients with AKID with a structured dialysis cessation, with structured dialysis cessation criteria. So in this study, we are even in the comparator group looking rigorously for uh, the opportunity to stop dialysis on a daily basis. And our primary endpoint is the proportion of patients with renal recovery at hospital discharge, with renal recovery defined as 14 days off dialysis, so an extended period of renal recovery. Those days don't have to happen in the hospital. You can, have, you can be discharged if you've just come off dialysis and have your renal recovery uh, at home. Our planned enrollment is 220 patients. We're at about 160 patients, and we really hope that over the next year we'll be able to finish this study um, uh, and uh, examine the impact of our early dialysis cessation strategy. Similarly, Sam Silver and his colleagues um, uh, in Canada have, another, have a similar pilot protocol to try to understand how we can best stop dialysis. This protocol focuses on both standardized dialysis and structured discontinuation. So their intervention here uh, focuses on minimizing intradialytic hypotension through a variety of strategies, including cooling the dialysate, changing the metabolic composition of the dialysate, as well as maximizing the ultrafiltration rate. Um, this also has a structured dialysis discontinuation approach um, uh, uh, where you have to meet all of these criteria to, in fact, stop dialysis. So you can't just have no metabolic derangements. You have to have no meta metabolic derangements and some urine output. So wrapping this up, um, uh, you know, I'll say that you know there has been a lot of interest in sort of how to care for patients uh, after hospital dis moving on to the hospital discharge setting. There's been a lot of interest in sort of developing consensus recommendations for how to follow patients after hospital discharge. This is data from ADKEY 22. The ADKEYs are a series of um, consensus meetings, right, where, um, and this one was focused on quality improvement uh, in the setting of acute kidney injury. And as part of the this, um, we developed sort of some catchy acronyms, right? Who doesn't love a catchy acronym, right? And this one is focused on um, an approach to sort of um, best practices for renal replacement therapy um, after, uh, uh, after hospital discharge in patients with AKID, right, focusing on sort of you know care, more careful assessments of things like weight uh, and more careful, more higher vigilance for um, uh, hypotension, as well as assessments of clearance, to, in part to get a sense of underlying renal function. I think the humbling thing is in 2024, despite the fact that our large our LDOs have AKID protocols. Um, we know that the management, unfortunately, of patients with AKID and end-stage kidney disease patients in the outpatient setting is very similar. This is data from Ian McCoy, uh, one of our junior faculty at UCSF. This is data from uh, one of the LDOs, and in this analysis, he compared patients who were admitted to um, this LDO with either incident AKID or incident end-stage kidney disease and compared sort of the basics of management of these patients kind of across those organizations. And you can see that the measurements are actually quite similar, right? So um, the number of days with any blood work is a little bit higher but not statistically different between patients with incident AKID and end-stage kidney disease. The number, the proportion of patients with 24-hour urines collected, 28% in the AKID, 16% in the end-stage kidney disease. So really not that much difference in sort of what's being measured in a population with AKID where you should be looking and vigilant for recovery in a patient who's a patient population that's defined as having end-stage kidney disease. And similarly in this analysis, um, uh, Ian showed that if you look at patients um, who recover versus those who do not uh, recover, right, that, the, the, that there was no difference in sort of the initial frequency of treatment and, no, and the number of patients who had no change in the treatments during, uh, during frequency or follow-up. So, so in this analysis, he looked either for patients who weaned off of dialysis by shortening the treatment time or who weaned off dialysis by decreasing the number of days of therapy, really no difference between those who recovered and those who continued dialysis. And I think what's really striking is if you look at the number of patients in the recovered arm who are able to go from three times a week dialysis to no dialysis at all, 
that's 82% of his cohort, right? So the vast majority of these patients probably have renal recovery for some period of time and are going for outpatient dialysis because they're able to go from 60 to zero all at once, right? And so I think, again, really highlighting the fact that despite our, all of our LDOs have an AKID protocol where they're monitoring for renal recovery, that we need to be thinking about how to do this better um, because um, if you were to ask our patients with AKID, they would say that this is the most important out for them, outcome for them. Our patient advocates consistently tell us that they, the, the one thing they want in life is to come off of dialysis. So I'm going to shift now and talk a little bit about what happens to patients with less severe AKI. I'll say that um, in our analyses, if you think about patients with AKID, they're probably about 3% of our overall AKI population. It's a tiny fraction of our patients with AKI. Um, so we, um, over the years, have done a number of analyses, again, using Kaiser Permanente of Northern California as a representative cohort uh, to examine the association of AKI with a number of outcomes. And so this is data that Alan Goh and I generated. Um, obviously, these are, um, uh, these, uh, these events are not super common, so we look at a number of composite events, and you can see here that in, our, in a multivariable analysis, uh, AKI is associated with a subsequent increase in the risk of a composite of ACS, PAD, ischemic stroke, and heart failure. When you really drive down into the components, the vast majority of this uh, relationship is driven by heart failure um, and volume overload potentially in our patients. We've also done analysis focused on recurrent AKI. Um, uh, you know, does, does one episode of AKI beget other episodes of AKI, right? And so here we use a couple of different definitions um, of recurrent AKI. Um, I'm not going to belabor you with sort of how we define baseline. This is an issue that AKI nephrologists really love to argue about. Um, but suffice it to say that we use sort of a conventional KDGO type definition uh, for uh, AKI, for stage one AKI, and then in sensitivity analysis, we use a more severe definition, right? The, the um, power of using data sources like Kaiser Permanente of Northern California is that you can start with a huge basket of hospitalizations, uh, 1.7 million. This allows you to sort of hone down to, to over 400,000 individual patients, almost 40,000 uh, patients with AKI. Um, and in this analysis, uh, almost 30% of patients experience an episode of recurrent AKI. The median time to their next episode of AKI, because we're really focused on first episode, is just half a year. Um, not surprisingly, just as, you know, as I've shown you in other things, pre-admission GFR is an important driver of the episode of recurrent AKI. So you can see here that there's really a linear relationship between uh, the, with our patients with stage 4 CKD being at the highest risk of recurrent AKI. And again, this is, this is a slide sort of looking at sort of some of the other adjusted hazards. Not surprisingly, age, proteinuria, um, uh, severity of illness also associated with sort of a higher risk of AKI. Now, one of the challenges, I'll say, of this the, all of these observational studies of um, AKI and its impact on adverse outcomes is this relationship between acute kidney injury and chronic kidney disease, and how much of this relationship is, in fact, mediated by chronic kidney disease. Right? And I'll share with you sort of a really nice analysis from uh, uh, the Geisinger group that really, I think, highlights this point in an important way, right? So obviously, you can have sort of two causal models here, right? You can either have risk factors that lead to AKI, which leads to CKD and mortality, right? You could also have a direct relationship between AKI and mortality, right? If most of the relationship of AKI and mortality is mediated by chronic kidney disease, adjusting for chronic kidney disease in the pathway will, in fact, attenuate the relationship between AKI and mortality. So I think this is probably the first analysis um, uh, that uh, really sort of uh, honed in on this. So this is an analysis, actually, of patients with fully recovered AKI, right? Um, and what, they, what um, Buchlau and colleagues demonstrated in this analysis, there's a strong association um, between fully recovered AKI, uh, defined by creatinine criteria, with both um, death and de novo CKD. However, if you took um, the relationship with death and you adjusted it for both severity of the initial illness as well as the development of de novo CKD, 
you can see that that relationship is completely attenuated. So making the really important point that a lot of the relationships that we see between AKI and adverse events may in fact be mediated by chronic kidney disease. And right, importantly, this is fully recovered disease. Probably that relationship is even stronger uh, if you have partial incomplete delayed recovery de novo CKD. I'm gonna show you some of that data. And presumably this varies by outcome. So in terms of food for thought, um, this is my apple orange picture. We shouldn't compare an apple and an orange, right? So we really need to keep in mind that observational studies in this field are somewhat confounded. And one of the important confounders that I didn't allude to is the intensity of follow-up, right? Our patients with stage four CKD are more likely to have more follow-up. We have more data. And so we're able to, that, that, those relationships are confounded. So, and I think the other important point that I didn't make in this talk is that there's been a lot of interest in AKI and its impact on all sorts of outcomes. GI bleed, stroke, almost anything, length of my big toenail, right? And so it's important to also think about, we should really be careful when we look at these observational studies and we should really think about outcomes where we can have an important, clear, and uh, compelling biologic link, right? The relationship of AKI to cardiovascular disease may make sense because we know that AKI is in fact a state associated with hyperphosphatemia, dysregulation of the bone mineral metabolism axis, and so there's a compelling reason to think that there could be a link to vascular disease. Maybe not so, for, so much for some other things. And imp importantly, I think longitudinal cohort studies are really important, and they may, they may provide us with more clean estimates of the impact of a single risk factor. And I'm going to show you data from that. But these are costly, harder to do, and generalizable, right? So the field of AKI really sat with these observational studies in the field for about 10 years to give us information as these observational cohort studies uh, were conducted. So I'm going to share with you data. Then there have now been two cohort studies. Um, uh, that have uh, focused on this. The first of these is the Assess AKI study. This is a prospective matched cohort study of hospitalized adults with and without AKI enrolled with, within three months of uh, post-hospitalization. Uh, post You'll see that right, this study started in 2009. It took six years to enroll patients. Um, uh, and, um, and, uh, and so these are very long studies to do. Um, uh, this study had an in-person visit uh, during the hospitalization, and then really the follow-up started three months post-hospitalization. So really at the start of potentially CKD, these patients were followed annually with interim phone contacts. Um, uh, the, the clinical centers for this study were uh, the Kaiser Permanente UCSF site, as well as a Tribe AKI site um, led by Chirag Parikh focused on AKI after cardiovascular surgery. Vanderbilt University and the University of Washington. And in this analysis, we actually matched these patients. Uh, we matched patients with and without a KI on a number of factors to try to reduce confounding. Kind of the key matching factors were sort of site, which um, with a, a site focused on cardiovascular disease uh, allowed to match for things like cabbage, as well as sort of the pre-admission presence or absence of CKD. And then there were additional matching factors to try to refine those matches, but really trying to identify sort of uh, a a, a double cohort. So in this analysis, we then have measures of, um, so this is a matched cohort of about 1,500 patients um, uh, with and without AKI, right? The follow-up really starts at three months, and so the follow-up importantly starts with a baseline post-hospital measure of GFR and pertinuria, right? Patients are then followed um, for um, development of de novo CKD, cardiovascular events, death. And what you can see is that in the overall analysis, the uh, presence of AKI during a hospitalization is associated with an increased risk of de novo or progressive CKD, heart failure, and death. Um, and importantly, if you start to look at the associations, and not surprisingly, AKI is associated pretty strongly with CKD, sort of at those, despite those three-month measures. Importantly, if you look at the associations with things like heart failure and all-cause death, those associations are less significant if you adjust for uh, what kidney function is at that three-month time point after hospitalization. And this is not um, very different from uh, findings from other, the other large cohort study that's been done in this area. This is data from the ARID study, a similar um, parallel match cohort study. This is a UK study. Again, importantly, adjusting for um, uh, AKI, adjusting between their cohort for the presence or absence of uh, proteinuria and EGFR at three months. And again, in this analysis, 
there is no association of mortality with AKI after you adjust for that non-recovery of GFR. And not shown in this pretty uh, graphic from Kidney International is that similarly, if you look at the relationship of AKI with heart failure in this analysis, where heart failure is a little bit less prevalent than in the uh, assess AKI cohort, the relationship of it, uh, with heart failure is, sort of, is also attenuated. So I think highlighting the fact that we have these important observational uh, ways in which we know that AKI is associated with a number of adverse outcomes, but a lot of this may in fact be through the presence of uh, chronic kidney disease. So what can we do to sort of bend these relationships and change these outcomes? Right, again, there's been um, a lot of interest in sort of post-AKI care. This is a super busy slide, but really just trying to make the point that as you go from mild to severe AKI, right, the type of follow-up you may need depends, right, you may have more non-nephrology follow-up here, follow-up here may really focus on nephrology providers, right, and again, sort of uh, this concept that um, there are some measures that might be focused uh, on with post, high quality post-AKI care, right, we don't know at this point sort of how much these measures impact um, uh, post-AKI uh, patient uh, outcomes, but there's been a lot of interest and recommendations in this field. We do know some things about our post-AKI patients. We know that, in fact, post-AKI testing is relatively limited. This is data from the USRDS. Um, this is data focused on the uh, NIS, which is a representative national inpatient sample. And this is looking at the number, the proportion of patients of older adults um, who have an episode of AKI defined based on diagnosis code, which typically is defining more severe AKI than that small, those small bumps in serum creatinine, right? Somebody wrote that the patient had AKI in the chart, um, and the coders coded that. And what you can see in this analysis is that the proportion of patients, and this is looking at the proportion of patients who have outpatient testing within six months. This is Medicare data, so you're, the USRDS is actually able to make this link. What you can see is that, uh, that after an episode of AKI, only about 75% of adults have some measure of kidney function within the next six months uh, after that episode of AKI. That's sort of the total bar here. And if you look for patients who have both, um, both a measure of creatinine as well as a measure uh, of proteinuria, you're down in sort of like the 12 to 15% range. And that really has not changed over the last five to six years. And in fact, the USRDS has this data going back even further. It hasn't changed for a long time. So we know that our rates of post-AKI testing are relatively limited. And we also know, for example, uh, that patients discontinue medications after AKI. We don't know when they're res restarted. This is data from a nice heart failure study, just making the point that, not surprisingly, uh, if, af if after a milder episode of AKI, fewer medications are discontinued, shown in the green bars uh, compared to the red bars, but um, uh, that a substantial proportion of patients are discontinuing ACE ARB after AKI, and who knows when these medications are restarted. So this brings me then to sort of the final study that I want to talk about. This is a study that I've had the good fortune of becoming recently involved in. This is the COPE AKI study, right, really trying to figure out where do our patients go on their post-AKI journey. This is a study focused on the um, uh, COPE AKI caring for outpatients after acute kidney injury. This is a multi-center NIH study focused on improving outcomes for our outpatients after AKI and really trying to understand sort of what the barriers and drivers to their care are. Right, so this is a study, the University of Pittsburgh is the uh, SDRC for this study. Three clinical sites, um, each comprised of multiple hospitals, um, Cleveland Clinic Metro Health, Vanderbilt uh, UAB, Hopkins, Maryland, and Yale. And really the hypothesis of this study is that um, compared to usual care, a multimodal process of care intervention will increase the odds of hospital-free days through 90 days, right? Obviously, it's challenging to design outcomes for studies of AKI after discharge. Um, hospital-free days is, uh, turns out to be a nice outcome um, in that it has a lot of power to detect small differences uh, between patients in these two arms. Um, not surprisingly, a number of um, uh, secondary endpoints focused more directly on um, kidney outcomes, right? We obviously want to improve outcomes in general for these patients, but focusing more specifically on kidney outcomes, lower rates of major adverse kidney events, which is a composite of um, dialysis, uh, persistent AKI, uh, and death, lower rates of recurrent AKI, and greater improvement in patient-reported outcomes. This is a phase three randomized parallel arm trial. I should say, importantly, um, this is a study that 
as I think the field is moving forward, was designed with patient advocates in mind, right? So I think one of the growing areas of interest in the AK in all of the kidney disease field, but in particular in AKI, is to involve patients in the designs of these trials so that our studies are really focused on patient-centered outcomes, right? Get the, keep the patient out of the hospitals may be more important than preserving the exact GFR. So the inclusion criteria for this study are, um, are obviously, this is a study of adults. This is a study of um, patients with uh, persistent severe AKI defined as at least a doubling of creatinine that persists on more than one day, right? So your patient who comes in with prerenal azotemia, probably not eligible for this study. These are people who have AKI that persists in the hospital, so a group of high-risk patients. The key exclusion criteria for this study are, um, are I sort of are you know non-ATN type reasons for AKI and sort of, and other reasons and really non non-kidney end organ failure right the goal is to identify a relatively healthy group of people who don't have a ton of touch points with nephrologists right to try to identify a group of people who might benefit from uh, a multimodal intervention right so patients in the usual care arm uh, in this study uh, receive written information. Uh, regarding their kidney disease, nephrotoxins to be avoided, and sort of the importance of and need for follow-up with the physician. Uh, I will say, in addition, these participants' physicians receive information that their patient had an episode of AKI and that they should be aware that their patient had AKI in the hospital. So, these, so the usual care arm is not quite the usual care that our patients get after hospital discharge, but it's standardized communication about the episode of AKI. Participants in the multimodal arm receive a, a multimodal process of care intervention. Um, this is a nephrologist, nurse navigator, pharmacist intervention. Um, the nurse navigator is really the heart of the intervention in every way. Um, so these patients really have access to a nurse navigator who is calling them a couple days after discharge and then really available that to them on an ongoing basis over the 90-day follow-up period. Um, the nephrologist obviously reviews the chart, perform, has some recommendations, limited recommendations for follow-up, is available to the study team. And the pharmacist component of the intervention is really focused on uh, identifying medication errors, medication reconciliation. Um, and I think this is a really, it's a really exciting study. This is a novel approach to how we think about our patients uh, post-AKI. I've recently been thinking, you know, maybe what our patients in, maybe what our, my AKID patients seen at the LDO needs is a nurse navigator type intervention, right? Sort of, and thinking about sort of how we can really use a multimodal team uh, to, um, uh, to improve outcomes for these patients. The study is now six months into enrollment, and so it's a really exciting time. And I hope over the next few years we'll really learn um, how we can best care for these patients. And I think what I'll say that I've learned over the first couple hundred patients is the nurse navigator is not necessarily doing a lot of AKI related, related interventions. What's really humbling, right, is that each of these patients needs something individualized, but they don't have the right access points to care. And the, the nurse navigators are really fundamentally critical to getting them the right access to care to prevent them from staying in the hospital. So putting it all together um, uh, in terms of post-AKI care, um, we've talked about a lot of different things. So first, um, we talked about recovery from AKID, um, something we see commonly in the hospital. And I've shown you that this depends both on pre-morbid kidney function, and you need to think both about EGFR and proteinuria. Those are sort of independent measures of kidney function. They both contribute to the risk, risk of non-recovery. I've shown you that more dialysis in AKID may not be a good thing, um, that in fact we may, uh, we may prevent renal recovery in particular through the mechanism of hypotension. I hope that uh, over the next couple of years, we and Sam's group will be able to show you that um, uh, our strategies to wean dialysis uh, are, in, are in fact impactful. There's much more work needed in this area, in particular in the outpatient setting. I should say that, I don't know that I said it explicitly, our liberated intervention stops at hospital discharge because we can't control dialysis outside the hospital setting. Uh, we then focused on less severe acute kidney injury, um, which I've shown you also has significant long-term sequelae, but many of those sequelae are mediated through the impact of AKI on GFR and proteinuria, right? AKI sort of being a new reset for chronic kidney disease. Um, I showed you that uh, in, in our sort of current world, uh, post-AKI testing, which is needed for risk stratification, right? I've shown you that GFR and proteinuria are fundamental measures for us to risk stratify patients after AKI, yet virtually 
uh, very few of our patients are getting both, and only a three quarters of our patients are getting measurements of GFR within six months. And finally, I shared with you um, data from Copay KI, which is really a study focused on best care practices for our most risk, at risk patients with severe persistent AKI. Um, and finally, I just want to acknowledge um, a lot of people, first and probably most importantly, our patients who inspire this work every day and for whom we want to do better. Um, my many colleagues at UCSF over the years, Chi Shu, my division chief, who's been my friend and partner and colleague for many years uh, in this research, um, and our, uh, our research team and study coordinators, the Kaiser Permanente of Northern California group, who've been great collaborators on these important epidemiologic studies. Um, these collaborators at Vanderbilt and uh, Washington, Washington University have uh, worked with us on the uh, Liberated study, and Eddie is also um, uh, in COPE. The ADKEY 22, which is the ADKEY where I showed you the uh, data on consensus recommendations for care after AKI that I got to participate in. Um, assess AKI with many, many people. I should have said and many more for Assess AKI, but you know, some people who, you know, I really learned a lot about how to do these multi-center trials from. And finally, the large COPE AKI, COPE AKI consortium led by Kalaba Bebe, a very talented epidemiologist at the University of Pittsburgh, um, Paul Pilevsky and Linda Freed from the SDRC, and many other people. And I'll stop there. I've left a lot of time for questions and dialogue, and thank you for your attention. I think I was just Kathleen, to... thank you so much for a wonderful talk on AKI, and we have time for questions. L let me just start. I was on the consult service in January, and we had a lot of AKI, and we found ourselves having a dialogue of which of these patients need nephrology follow-up. I mean, you, you showed that yeah. what, even primary care follow-up and even just getting a, a UA is sparse, and we don't have the capacity to see um, all of these patients in nephrology, but clearly some of them are at very high risk. And so how do you approach that question? So that's a, I mean, I think that's the, that, that's the tough question that everybody faces, right? Like, who, who do you have seen? When do you have them seen? And, and I think, in my mind, it depends a little bit on who else, who, who else is on the team, right? And sort of, and sort of how, how, what's the likelihood of them being able to come to another appointment, right? So, you know, so I'll say that in COPE, one of the groups of patients that's really specifically excluded are some of our cancer patients, right? Obviously, onconephrology is a huge area, right? But on average, our, we know that our, onco, our, our onconephrology patients have closer follow-ups with their nurse navigators, right? There are ways to get them in. They may not need the clinic appointment with Dr. Humphreys because they're, their oncology care team knows that if the creatinine doesn't get better, they know how to reach out to that person. So I think that it, so I think finding those people, and you could argue that in some senses, for some of these people who are really overwhelmed after they get out of the hospital, right? They've got the appointment with the cardiologist and the primary care doc and the this person and the that person, that maybe for the first couple months, we can think about them seeing other people and what they need is that three month re-risk stratification. Yeah. Where do you think that think so, so I think so, so. So more data is needed. I think there's a lot of there's a lot of interest. I'm laughing because um, uh, because you know Alpa Kisler has been thinking about uh, Vanderbilt's been thinking about this for like five years. Five years ago, Alpa was like, we should be studying this. But I think there's a lot of promise for SGLT2 inhibitors. Right. Also, a lot of interest. Right. With some of these new studies suggesting that maybe SGLT you know, in the chronic kidney disease literature that SGLT2 inhibitors help get you back on the ACE ARB. So I think thinking through sort of like how to get people on these, but also how to do it, do this safely, right? So I do think, again, like we don't want to look too far in the future. We'll learn a lot from COPE AKI about why people are rehospitalized and things like that, which I think will be important. But a lot of people are doing pilot studies, I think, in this area now. <laughs> 
Yeah, those patients are, right, those are like the hardest patients, right? I mean, if so Steve Coco was standing here, he'd say, well, how much of that AKI is really AKI, right? Like, right, there's this concept in the heart failure literature of permissive hypercreatinemia, right? And sort of like, you know, where does that balance, right? Does that, where does that balance fall? I think those are the hard, I mean, I think those are the hardest patients for us, right? And that's exactly where I think this nurse navigator intervention is probably the most helpful, right? Because you don't want your patient to go home on diuretics and to keep diuresing till they've lost 30 kilos of weight. So I think, but, but those are, but those people on the razor's edge are really, I think, the hardest people. And I think there's been a lot of talk, right, about whether or not you use, you know, how you can use nurse practitioners, right, to sort of help those people follow up. It didn't really answer your, I didn't really answer your question because that is sort of, that's the one that we struggle with. I mean, and I think it's an interesting question too of, right, I'm a nephrologist, I love the kidneys beyond life itself, right? But if I'm a patient, I probably care a lot more about my shortness of breath, like, like sort of where the balance is for the patient in terms of their sort of risk benefit may be different than my view as a nephrologist. Some, somebody else asked me this question. I mean, I think it's a really important question that we don't think we don't think about that much, right? And we don't, in our non-invasive world these days, right? We don't measure that carefully, right? There's this fascinating literature, actually, if you look at um, uh, liver transplantation and you look at the renal injury that occurs um, in the setting of liver transplantation, and it's mostly related to the venous congestion that occurs when you cross-clamp the IVC, right? Um, and this has been very nicely shown in animal models that you can mimic that injury. So I think we don't, we don't know, right? And, um, you know, there's been interest in this concept of, right, what really matters is renal, perfu right, renal perfusion pressure, right? And, um, you know, Michael Connor and the folks who really focus on abdominal compartment syndrome have really kind of made this point that probably in abdominal compartment syndrome you want to focus on renal perfusion pressure. But it's both what's going in and sort of how much pressure there is to get out. So it's tough. Well, I think, I think recurrent AKI is, I mean, I think the hard thing, right, is I think that physiologically there are people who clearly sort of have the fibrosis injection. I think, you know, the challenge is that, I think one of the things I didn't talk about, right, the elephant in the room for the whole AKI field is that it's still a wastebasket diagnosis, right? Like the way I've defined AKI, like on slide three with the KDGO definition, is everything, you could define everything from pre-renal azotemia to, it, you know, to ATN, to something in between with those criteria. And I think to your point, like I think, I do think much as we've talked about biomarkers for the last 15 years, I, I do think that maybe that as an, that AKI, the AKI community needs to take a step back and say, maybe we don't really know what's going on. Like we, we know there are injury markers, we know there are fibrosis markers, but maybe we just need to take a bunch of patients and measure a bunch of the markers, not agnostically in some way, and sort of say, okay, there's this phenotype of person who has AKI and they come back with current AKI, and those people have sky high EGF levels, right? And one of the challenges is you don't know if you need to measure those biomarkers at the start or the end of the AKI. But I think, I guess what I'd say is we don't know. I think that probably in some patients those mechanisms are very much at play and other people we probably don't understand the mechanisms, and this is the this is the tough this is the tough thing for therapeutics in this area that I think we still have very much a hodgepodge of patients within this group. Well, thank you very much, Kathleen. For a thank you for so much for having me.